Hello everyone and welcome to today's lecture. Today we're going to be focusing on chapter 5 and we're going to examine how and why drugs work. In this chapter we're going to be looking at the effects that drugs have on our bodies while we're using them and after we're done using them. What happens when they leave our systems and what happens when we're chemically dependent and withdrawal starts to kick in. There are a lot of issues to consider when we talk about these things so let's go ahead and get started. First of all, we know that from our initial discussions of recreational drug use that sometimes drugs are used for purposes other than what they were originally intended for. For example, NyQuil is meant to be used as a cough medication, but it also has the added benefit of helping you go to sleep so that you can rest up and feel better faster. But remember that I can take NyQuil at any point. If I'm not sick, it's still going to help me fall asleep. So sometimes these unintended responses are not all that bad. It's never that harmful to help me fall asleep, unless you take some NyQuil and then you go drive. But all of these medications have warning labels on them so that you're aware of the potential side effects. As we stated in our earlier lectures, side effects can be a lot worse than just falling asleep depending on the med medications that you're taking. But when we're discussing these issues, always keep in mind that the ultimate goal is what the ultimate goal is rather for the medication. What are you taking it for and is that what it was originally intended to do? Typically, as you move from licit to illicit drug use, you see the risk of more physical side effects increase. Of course, some very strong licit drugs, prescription drugs, and even alcohol can cause many of these side effects as well. But more often, you associate things like nausea with illicit substance use. Admittedly, taking a lot of prescription meds on an empty stomach can also result in nausea. Many substances can cause changes in mental alertness. Alcohol and marijuana, for example, are both depressants and can cause mental reactions to decrease. Cocaine and methamphetamines are both stimulants, which they are going to help cause your mental alertness to increase significantly. Withdrawal is a much different story and is traditionally the earmark of dependence. Basically, withdrawal begins when the last traces of your drug's active ingredient leaves your system and your body is searching and looking for more. When your body does not find the drug that it's looking for, it begins to panic and all of the symptoms that you essentially held at bay with the drug use start to kick in. If you, are, if you keep taking a certain drug over a prolonged period of time, it might, might not even be about the high after a certain point. It might just be about keeping even to avoid going into withdrawal. Withdrawal often manifests itself with nausea, vomiting, shaking, fever, sometimes you start to sweat very badly, pain, heart attack, seizures, and even some behavioral issues start to take place. Depending on what you're withdrawing from, you can even die from the withdrawal. Drugs like heroin cannot be quit cold turkey or you're going to end up passing away from the withdrawal. This means that someone has to oversee the withdrawal process to monitor your progress. Some drugs can cause allergic reactions, either because you're mixing drugs together and they're interacting, or you're allergic to something contained within the drug itself. I think I told you before, but I'm allergic to everything within the psyllin family and also to codeine. So knowing that I'm allergic to these drugs allows me to alert my doctor to not prescribe me these substances. But sometimes you don't know that you're allergic until you take the drugs for the first time. Some allergic reactions can become quite severe. And finally, there may be changes to your heart's normal rhythm. The presence can decrease your heart's normal rhythm and stimulants um, often increase the heart rhythm. For example, if you take too much cocaine, then you can potentially have a heart attack as a result. If you are in a state where they allow for phys physician-assisted suicide, you're going to essentially take too much morphine, which will cause you to pass away. Morphine is also given to heart patients at the end of life to help ease their breathing, cause them to be relaxed and not panic, and allow for the heart rhythm to slow naturally on its own. But it's, it's more often used as a pain reliever in hospitals in much smaller doses to those who have been severely injured or who have just gone through different types of surgery. This chart from your book examines the most common side effects derived from specific drugs. You'll notice that certain drugs target specific areas of the body more often than others do. Alcohol targets the brain, liver, and kidneys, 
but the withdrawal from alcohol or just having a regular hangover also targets the stomach in addition to those different areas. The withdrawal of different substances can off, often lead to pain throughout the body depending on which type of sus, substance that you are withdrawing from. But this chart is looking at prolonged use and abuse of the drug. Eventually these organ systems are going to start shutting down if you use the drug long enough. Alcoholics often need liver transplants or have to begin dialysis to combat the harm that their drinking has caused over the years. The main effects and side effects of different drugs affect everyone differently. Our body chemistries, meaning our height, our weight, and our gender for instance, and how long we've been using the drug in question all have an influence on how the drug will affect us individually. But in addition, how much of the drug we take will also be influential in how the drug affects us. So when we talk about the dose of the drug, we're talking about the amount of drug that you're taking at one given time. Normally, this means the dose that is recommended by the drug company for the specific drug in question. One teaspoon of cough medicine, one to two Tylenol. That's the prescribed dose. But there is certainly the difference between the recommended dose and the amount that you eventually take. The more of the drug that you take, the less effective it becomes because your body is used to having that drug in its system. So as your tolerance increases, you're going to end up having to take more and more of the drug for that drug to become effective. This means that the potency of the drug also needs to increase. Potency is referring to the amount of the drug that needs to be taken in order for your body to feel the effects of that drug. For example, let's talk about Oxycontin. Oxy, as you know from class, is a pain reliever and it's often prescribed for pro chronic pain problems. Well, Oxy, admittedly, is a fantastic drug, drug to use in the beginning and often on a short-term basis. But because it's very effective, it's very rarely prescribed on a short-term basis. So let's say I take some Oxy. My pain is relieved temporarily, but then it starts to come back. But the prescribed dose is no longer working for me. So I either need a stronger prescription or I have to start taking more pills. When that option doesn't work anymore, I now have to switch to stronger pills or take more pills yet again. As we keep going and going, dependence can kick in and I'm now no longer using the pills for their intended use. I'm simply using them for the dependence. When we're using these items in the short term, there's nothing to worry about. The prescribed dose normally matches the potency level for the drug. But once tolerance increases, and potentially once dependence kicks in, then we're going to have to adjust for dose and potency levels as well. As we're talking about the dose of the drug that is administered, we have to discuss the dose, dose response as well. This looks at the type of effect that we will see based on the dose that is administered. So let's say I take two Tylenol. Will my headache go away? Well, that's going to depend on my tolerance to the drug, but it also depends on a few other things. So, disregarding Tylenol for a second, let's think about other types of drugs. What can I take that comes in different forms? My example on the screen is cocaine. We all know that cocaine comes in different forms, namely in powder and crack. Powder is ready to go. You can snort it, you can get a very fast high. There's not much else that you need to do. You can also smoke it. Some individuals end up lacing their pot with powder cocaine and they end up smoking the two together. It has a very different effect than if, if one drug was just used on its own. But if you're going to use crack, then you can either smoke it or you can inject it. Even though crack and powder cocaine are pharmaceutically identical, many consider crack to be the more addictive form of the drug. Mainly this thought process comes from the way in which the drug is used. Injecting the drug directly into your bloodstream creates a nearly instantaneous high. In addition to the manner in which the drug is used, you also have to look at the rate in which it is metabolized and eliminated from the system. This rate is dependent on the user's body chemistry. This is what we were discussing before. Based on your height, your weight, your gender, your usage his history, and whatever else you have in your system, are all going to affect how quickly your body can process the drug that you just ingested and how much of an effect that you're going to feel. 
These factors will also interact with the type of drug you use, the quality of that drug, the form of the drug in which you use it, and the way in which you use that drug. This chart is looking at the dose response for three individuals who have used aspirin to treat a headache. If you're looking at the x-axis of the chart, you're going to see that the dose is increasing as you move to the right, and if you're looking at the y-axis, that's representing the response that is put into effect after taking the specific dose. Basically what this chart should suggest is that user C will have to take a dose that is nearly three times as large or as strong as the dose that user A takes in order to feel the same effect. This is indicating that not everyone feels the same effect for the same dose. So this makes it very difficult to try and prescribe medications to different people. If you prescribe 300 milligrams of aspirin to all three of these same people, really only user A is going to feel some effect from that specific dose, and it isn't even going to be enough to correct the headache altogether. While we're talking about the dose effect, we also have to acknowledge that some drugs will promote more of an effect than others. Aspirin might require a higher dose before you feel the effect, as we just saw. Heroin, on the other hand, requires a much smaller dose before you start to feel the effects. That's because it's a very potent drug. In other words, you only need a smaller dose to achieve the desired result. It's a very strong drug. In addition to that, in, in, or rather, in addition to its strength and its potency, heroin is a very dangerous drug because it's highly toxic. Think of it this way. Most individuals who use heroin have to learn what the correct dose is in order to feel the effects of heroin. There is no recommended dose label on the packaging that you buy from your drug dealer. Maybe you have a friend who's used it before and that individual is helpful in trying to get you to the correct amount. But if you don't have that friend, how do you know when too much is more than enough? How do you find the correct dose that allows you to get high without accidentally overdosing in the process. That's what we call the margin of safety. Trying to find neutral ground between achieving your high without overdosing. And the more toxic the drug, the more difficult it is to find this neutral ground. So remember when we discussed last time the dangerousness of the different drug use in the last chapter? We discussed cannabis as being the least dangerous with a use toxicity ratio of 1 to 20,000, and heroin use as being the most dangerous with a use toxicity ratio of 1 to 6. One of the reasons why heroin is so dangerous has to do with the way that the drug is used. Injecting heroin is the most dangerous and also the most effective way to use it. Heroin is most often mixed with water and then subsequently it's injected. Injecting it minimizes the lag time between when the drug is taken and when the effects are felt. With injection, the effects are felt almost in immediately. It can also be smoked or snorted or eaten, but smoking or eating actually is going to destroy some of the drug and it will end up muting the effects. When someone takes heroin, there's often an immediate rush. Then the body feels an extreme form of relaxation, and often the user reports a decreased sense of pain. Basically what's happening inside the body is that heroin is turning into morphine. Morphine has a chemical structure similar to endorphins. Endorphins, as you may know, are the chemicals that your brain makes when you feel stressed out or you're in pain. Endorphins inhibit your neurons from firing, so they're going to halt the pain that you're feeling, and it essentially creates a good feeling that leaves the user really relaxed. Most people who die from heroin overdoses die because their bodies forget to breathe. Heroin makes someone calm and just a little bit sleepy, but if you take too much, then you fall asleep, and when you're asleep, your respiratory drive essentially shuts down. When you're sleeping, your body naturally remembers to breathe. In the case of a heroin overdose, you fall asleep and essentially your body forgets to do its job. A heroin overdose can cause your blood pressure to dip significantly and cause your heart to fail. Heroin can also cause arrhythmia, a problem with the rate or the rhythm of your heartbeat. During an arrhythmia, your heart might not be able to pump enough blood to the body and the lack of blood flow affects your brain, your heart, and multiple other organs. This all can happen really quickly and the user can be dead within a matter of hours. 
but normally when overdoses happen that fast, the user is mixing drugs together. This chart shows what we mean when we're looking for that margin of safety that I mentioned earlier. The orange line on the left represents taking enough of the drug to feel an effect. You can continue to take more, but the higher the dose that, you're, that you take, the closer you're getting towards the lethality dose. Once you've reached the blue line on the right, you're approaching overdose and potential death. So, if you're using the drug to feel a stronger high than just the normative effect of the drug, you have to find the dose that falls right in between these two lines. That's difficult to do, as we've been discussing so far with intravenous drug use specifically. Most people take multiple drugs at one time. We've talked about how large the prescription drug industry is and how many Americans have multiple prescriptions for medications that are being legitimately prescribed to them. Most doctors often check to make sure that you're not taking things that are going to neg negatively interact with one another or that will amplify the effect of one drug over the other. But there are times where these interactions escape the notice of the doctor or the pharmacist. These can happen in a variety of different ways. For example, you can experience the additive effect of two drugs. Generally, this is not harmful depending on what it is that you're taking. But remember it this way. I have posted the picture of the Advil and the Tylenol bottles together. They're basically the same drug, right? They both do the same thing. If you take one Advil and you take one Tylenol, it would basically be the same as taking two Advil or two Tylenol. These drugs are interacting with one another to create the same effect on a more pronounced level. There's nothing harmful about taking two over-the-counter pain relievers together. If you were to take two different sleeping pills or two much stronger pain relievers, then that might start to cr create an issue. But in general, this isn't a category that's really going to cause much harm to you if you're on the prescription side of things. But if you then take two different hallucinogens for recreational purposes, you now might be causing a sticky situation for yourself. We also have drugs that have an, an, that have an antagonistic effect. This means that they're battling one another out. I always associate this idea with Elvis Presley. We know that the, at the end of his life, Elvis had a very large pill problem and was taking them like candy towards the end of his life. He gained a lot of weight and was taking everything he could get his hands on. He had pills to put him to sleep, and he had pills to wake him up in the morning, and he had pills that kept him going throughout the day. When it was time to sleep again, he'd have to take something else that was going to cancel out the uppers he was taking to get himself throughout the day. When your dependence levels are that high, you really cannot deviate from the routine of trying to cancel out the effects of the drugs without harming yourself. You're using a stimulant to cancel out a depressant, and vice versa. The other example that I always think about um, is from the movie Pulp Fiction. Remember the scene where Mia Wallace snorts heroin thinking that it's cocaine? She passes out and is beginning to overdose on the substance. Then Vincent Vega gets her to his dealer's house and they have to slam a hypodermic needle full of epinephrine into her chest trying to counter the overdose. Even though there's many issues with the scene in the movie, that's essentially what we're talking about here. They're using one drug to cancel out the effects of the other drug. Essentially, we have to discuss um, what we call synergistic effects that drugs can have. Here you're seeing one drug increase the effects of another drug. This can be a very negative enhancement that we don't necessarily want to occur. For example, if you're drinking while you're smoking marijuana, you're using two depressants together. So they're going to further exacerbate the depressive qualities of, of each other. One of the issues that drug users face when they're taking drugs that have synergistic effects is that they become so impaired while they're under the influence of that drug that they forget whether or not they even took the drug to begin with. So they often then consume more of the drug, making the effects that much stronger. This is the drug interaction that we're most concerned about in terms of dangerousness. The way in which you ingest the drug will depend on how fast you feel the effects of that drug. If you take something orally, it normally takes a while for you to feel anything. Taking a drug in pill form or eating it, like a marijuana cookie or a brownie, requires digestion. 
your stomach lining essentially absorbs the active ingredient of the drug and has to pass them through into your bloodstream. This can take a while, especially if there are other items in your stomach. If you recently ate a meal, the food that is present in your stomach is going to block or diminish the effects of that drug. Sometimes this is purposive. If a medication is very strong, doctors will prescribe that the pills be taken with food or with a glass of milk to help coat your stomach. Other times, food helps to slow the effects of the drug. That's why you might get hungry when you're intoxicated or drunk. Or why people suggest that you have a cup of coffee to try and sober you up. They're trying to get something in your stomach that's going to counteract the alcohol. If you inhale the drug, it takes a very short amount of time for you to feel the effects of that drug. Breathing in the drug sends it directly to your lungs, which then send the active ingredients of the drug into your bloodstream as they're secreted through the lungs' membranes. One of the biggest issues that we have with inhaling drugs is the material that you're inhaling. Not only are you inhaling the drug itself, but a lot of drugs are mixed with other chemicals and materials that allow them to be cooked down. Take methamphetamine, for example. Very low quality meth and shake and bake meth often requires that you use items like antifreeze and lighter fluid in the cooking of the actual crystal. Now you're breathing in lighter fluid and antifreeze. That's not so healthy. You can also inject your drugs. This, in, this creates an almost instantaneous high because you're able to inject the drug directly into your bloodstream. There's no going through the stomach or the lungs or the skin. You're directly in there. But there are large problems with injection that we don't necessarily see with other methods of taking the drug. First, we have already discussed the idea that overdosing is a lot easier because users don't know how much of the drug to directly inject. With higher frequency users, you run the risk of ruining your veins and running out of places to inject. You often see track marks on a lot of, of drug dependent users who are continuously looking for places to inject. They can cause their veins to collapse, and if medical intervention is necessary, doctors and nurse, nurses often have trouble finding good veins to even use. Really desperate drug users will start injecting between their fingers or even their toes trying to find a usable vein to inject their drugs into. Furthermore, intravenous drug users don't always have a clean needle to use every time they shoot up. This can cause infection at a minimum or even severe diseases like HIV AIDS if the users start to share needles with one another. Typically, we have drugs that can be topically applied. This means that certain drugs like topical ointments can be applied directly to the skin. It also means that you can snort certain drugs through the nose and the drug can be disseminated through the lining of your nostrils. Engaging in this method of use can result in a slower high since the active ingredient of the drug has, takes a while for it to pass through your system. However, once the drug does enter your bloodstream, it doesn't take very long before you start to feel the effects. It's just a matter of getting it into the bloodstream in the first place. Once the drug is in your bloodstream, your body almost instantaneously starts to metabolize it. This process can take a while depending on the drug in question and your specific body chemistry. If the drug is the type that attaches to your fatty tissue, then it will be, it, then it will be absorbed in the body rather and will stay around longer than those that do not get absorbed into your fatty tissues. We talked before about how long the drug can stay in your system and still be picked up in a drug test. This is exactly what we're talking about here, the process of biotransformation. Biotransformation is the process of changing the chemical or pharmacological properties of a drug through metabolism. Your liver is going to be the main organ that aids in metabolizing the drugs in your body, and your kidney is going to the, be the main, the most important rather organ for drug elimination. Certain drugs take a few days for the active ingredients to be completely metabolized out of your system. So we've talked about the different ways in which I can use the drug and how fast I will start to feel the effects of that drug, but how much is enough? The threshold dose is referring to the amount of the drug that I need to take in order to feel some sort of an effect. This is not the same thing as the dose response curve. Remember, that was talking about how much aspirin I would need in order to feel complete relief from my headache. The threshold dose in other, it, otherwise 
is referring to the amount of aspirin that I would need to take to experience any effect whatsoever. I might not even be aware that the effect is taking place, but a chemical ch change is taking place somewhere within my body with this small amount or this small dose that I have just taken. In addition, as you continue to take the drug and you continue to use it at a higher frequency, there may come a time in which the drug no longer works for you. The dose for your pain medication is too low and you have stopped feeling any relief after you take it. This is called the plateau effect. You essentially have hit a wall and the drug is no longer working for you. There is no effect taking place because your body has become so used to having the drug at this dose all of the time. So what are my options now? Well, you either need to move to a stronger form of the medication, meaning that you move from a one milligram version of it to the two milligram version in order to start feeling anything at all. The plateau effect typically occurs with over-the-counter medicines and low-strength prescription meds. But if you're trying to beat the plateau effect on your own, you might try to take more of the medication in a shorter amount of time in order to feel something. If you take more of the medication than is recommended in a short amount of time, then you end up essentially compounding the medication. So you're adding the effects of the first dose to the effects of the second dose. This is called the cumulative effect. This occurs when you do not allow your body time to process the first dose fully before you take the second dose. This isn't an issue if you're taking Tylenol too early, but what happens when you're taking two Vicodin in a short amount of time? The effects will be stronger and you'll be loopier than if you had just taken one Vicodin in the allotted amount of time. This is a concern, especially if you're taking drugs that have a higher toxicity level than other drugs. The drugs that you ingest are also going to affect you differently based on things like age, gender, and even pregnancy. With age, younger drug users often feel the effects of a drug much more strongly than older individuals do. This is due to a few factors. First, when we're talking about adolescents and teenagers that haven't had as much exposure to drug and alcohol before, their tolerance levels are a lot lower than someone who has been drinking for years, for instance. In addition, their bodies are typically smaller and weigh significantly less than those of adults. When this occurs, their bodies can't consume as much of the drug as an adult can. Differences in gender often follow the same pathway. Women are often shorter and weigh less than males, for example. That means that they cannot consume as much as men and often get drunk faster on much less alcohol, even if they are drinking the same type of alcohol as their male counterparts. There are also hormonal and chemical differences between genders that have an effect on drug consumption and the effects that are felt. Finally, pregnancy is a particularly tricky one. As we know, as the fetus develops, it starts to take all of its needs from its mother's body. That's why a good diet is often encouraged as the mother is providing all of the nutritional needs for their child while in utero. But this also means that expecting mothers have to quit all of their bad habits, from drinking coffee, to drinking alcohol, to smoking, and even stopping some uh, specific prescription drug use that she was taking before the pregnancy occurred. But sometimes mothers don't stop taking these substances. Not, are, not only are the substances affecting the mother in a different way now, but they also can have a harmful effect on the fetus as well. This slide addresses the differences between genders in terms of alcohol consumption. So if we're looking at a man and a woman who are the exact same age and the exact same weight, we still see that the, that the woman would get drunk faster on the same amount of drinks consumed in the same period of time. Of course, this chart does not specifically say anything about each individual's height, which is a variable that would affect consumption as well. But this shows that even when all things are equal, there's still going to be a gender difference that occurs in terms of intoxication levels. Regardless of the different factors that influence the way that drugs affect us, we all have the ability to develop tolerance or tolerance to or dependence on a specific drug. Tolerance suggests that the more that we take a drug, the less it is, it's going to affect us. Let's say I'm a regular drinker. 
one beer is probably not going to give me a buzz. Two or three beers, on the other hand, might start to have an effect. But you, you're not a regular drinker, so that one beer might give you the buzz that I'm lacking. The higher the tolerance we have for a particular drug, the more we have to take in order to feel the same effects of that drug. But the problem is that our tolerance, as our tolerance to the drug increases, so might our dependence on that same drug. Dependence refers to the idea that our bodies are so used to having that drug in our system that we are now functioning at a new normal. It feels normal to have cocaine in our system and when we don't continue to take that cocaine, then we start to go into withdrawal. Our bodies become both physically and psychologically dependent on the drug. Even if I were to get completely clean and withdraw from the drug, the psychological dependence might still be there. And that is often what causes dependent individuals to actually relapse. Not the physical need, but the mental desire to use again. This chart shows the different pathways that lead to either drug dependence or drug tolerance. You will see that they both start out the exact same way. You use the drug, you like how it feels, so you keep using it in order to achieve that good feeling again. But then that's where things branch off. If, you're, if you are becoming tolerant to the drug, you're taking it at a high, high enough frequency that your body and your brain have adapted to having that substance in your system. But you're not taking it at a high enough frequency that you're now chemically dependent on having that substance in your body. Once that chemi chemical dependence sets in, you either need to continue to use the substance at a high enough frequency and high enough dose to keep your body satisfied or you're going to start to go into withdrawal. And withdrawal, of course, occurs when you have stopped using the drug, but your body's still searching for and desiring that drug. And remember that withdrawal occurs both physically and psychologically. Physical withdrawal is the process of removing the drug from your system and breaking through the chemical dependence that your body has developed. Physical withdrawal often manifests itself in a variety of different physical symptoms like we discussed earlier in this lecture. But the psychological dependence is really the worst of the two. You can beat the physical withdrawal, but your brain always remembers the feeling that the drug has created. It's much more difficult to break the psychological dependence when you remember what it felt like to be drunk or high or stoned. That was a good feeling and you crave that feeling again, even if you are clean and sober and much healthier. So even if you are getting clean, the mental dependence makes you want to use again. Despite just going through the process of physical withdrawal, you're craving the high so much that you don't care about the negative consequences. You don't even care that you might have to go through withdrawal again if you can just use one more time. So when we're talking about these issues, you can see that the psychological dependence is much stronger than the physical dependence. And while we're on this point, in this class we're going to use the term dependence rather than addiction. You probably have noticed that I haven't even used the word addiction in this lecture at all. It is the preferred term from the medical community and from drug researchers alike. But even though dependence does seem like the worst case scenario, abuse is still possible without dependence becoming a factor. So how is that possible? This goes back to the idea of tolerance. I can drink more than the average person without developing a dependence on alcohol. But if the medical community only recommends one drink a day and no more than seven drinks per week, and I'm drinking two to three drinks a day, and I'm drinking all, or I'm drinking all seven drinks in one sitting, then this is clearly alcohol abuse. Binge drinking and heavy drinking are abusive behaviors, but if I'm only binge drinking on the weekend and then I allow my body to flush out all the toxins during the week, this does not necessarily, then my body does not necessarily look for that alcohol. But if I'm drinking two to three drinks per day and then I'm still binge drinking on the weekends, this is highly consistent with behavior that would lead towards dependence. So what does this all mean? that there is no one correct answer to explain or flush out drug use and dependence issues. Everyone and everything is different. 
There are a variety of factors that can influence the way that we use drugs, how they affect us, and whether or not we're going to develop a tolerance or full-blown dependence on the drug in question. In the next series of lectures, we're going to begin exploring individual drugs in a more specific manner. Next up, we're going to be examining central nervous system depressants and how they affect our physical and psychological processes. I'll see you then.